things in our hearts and lives. We love you. We give you this time, Lord Jesus, and thank you for it. Everybody say amen. You can be seated. And if you got your Bible, open up to Acts chapter 4 and hold on for a minute. We're going to get there in just a bit. Acts chapter 4, and um, that's what we'll read together, yeah. Um, real quickly, how many of you people, by a show of hands, hate snakes? Let me see them. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming the rest of you didn't hear me. <laughs> I hate snakes very, very much, all right. Um, I was watching this show. I love survival shows. Any kind of survival show, I'm all about it. And I was watching this survival show, and, and they placed these people in this swamp region that were literally surrounded by these horrible, horrible poisonous snakes. And, and these snakes were everywhere. I mean, they could not step. They couldn't walk 10 feet through this swampy area without these poisonous snakes coming at them. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, no way, dude. I'm, there's no, you know, no way I'm getting out there. And they had to kill dozens and dozens of snakes every day and every night. And I'm watching this, and, and you know, I like to interact with, with, on Twitter and social media and things like that and read. And, and what, what I thought was, and, and actually in the, one, of this, one episode, a snake actually bit a guy, bit the guy, and he's all swollen. His leg is about to pop off. I'm thinking, good Lord, you know, these are, these are deadly creatures. I, why are they here anyway? So they're killing these things, and that's the way I see a snake. The only good snake is a dead snake. I hate him. All right, so anyway, what drives me nuts is that there are people, I'll read comments that are watching this show, or I'll follow along and on Twitter, and if you don't know about Twitter, there's hashtags, and you can see what people are saying about this particular show. And I'm reading along, and there are actually these people who are commenting, um, who, who, and I would say these are softer, more politically correct people, you know, there's other harsher words that I could probably use for them. But they're saying things like, why are they killing these snakes? These are God's creatures. And, and, and we shouldn't be killing all these snakes. I mean, surely they can go. And I'm sitting there watching this thinking, are you, are you kidding me? You know, we leave, leave, live in this, this such a pathetic, politically correct world that people are more concerned about the snake. Whenever that episode where I saw this snake bite this guy, his leg is about to, you know, it's nasty, swollen, and he's about to die. And somebody's thinking, man, I feel sad for that snake. I'm thinking, if you feel so sad, how about we bag that snake up and drop it off on your front porch? You can take care of it. But, and and, and uh, what drives me nuts is when we get so politically correct and we get so soft with some of our approaches in, in life, when it starts to overflow into the church, I've got problems. And I see this taking place a lot here lately, you know, in, in this way. Is, and this isn't a bad, necessarily a bad thing, so don't, you know, don't think I'm throwing stones at this particular thing, all right? But there's a lot of people in the church who say things now along these lines that are politically correct. And they'll, they'll say, well, you know, I don't want to you know, share my faith so openly with people because I don't want to offend some people. And, and, and they'll, they'll justify that by saying, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just live a lifestyle of witnessing. And, and, and when I hear that, initially, that doesn't sound like a bad thing, does it? I, I, we want you to live a lifestyle that is a Christian lifestyle, a lifestyle of a disciple of Christ, where you're living a godly way. That's a good thing, right? Everybody say, yeah, that's a good thing. All right? And, and so we hear that, and I think, well, that's a great thing, but I also think that's, we're missing something there, because even though that's a great thing, it might be a great place to start, but in all honesty, there are times where you have to. You have to witness by speaking boldly. You have to stand up for what you believe by speaking boldly. Where your lifestyle, that's a good thing. It's a great place to start. But we shouldn't just let our lives be a witness. We should also use our words to witness. We've got to learn to speak boldly. So you can see, that's what we're talking about tonight, speaking boldly. Boldly. Good example is this, all right? We have 99% of us hate snakes. So you all come to my house. We, both, we all hate snakes. And we're walking down the street in my neighborhood. And if we look over and I happen to notice a snake, a particular poisonous snake, um, a snake that is, you know, designed as a def defensive mechanism to blend in to its natural surroundings. And so I happen to notice this snake, you know, just slithering there and, it's, and we're headed straight toward it. Now, what would be the greater act of kindness, the greater act of love, for me to just do this kind of thing and go, you know, and keep walking? 
and then you, you know, you, you either observe and notice me walking away, or, you know, but you walk, run into that snake and he bites you and, and you have a pretty bad day? Or would it be to, to actually, while we're walking, go, snake! And then we take our shovel and we do what God intended us to do. It chop that thing's head off through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then display his lifeless dead body in the neighborhood so all the other snakes get the word. <laughs> and then snap pictures of ourselves and post them on Instagram and Facebook to show how tough we are. <laughs> all right? That, there are times when speaking is necessary. It's necessary. And a lot of us have bought into this politically correct version of, of witnessing to where, well, I'm a lifestyle evangelist. I'm a lifestyle witnesser. And I'm thinking, that's a great start because we want you to live in a godly way. But listen, that's not enough. That's not enough. A couple key thoughts. A couple key thoughts we're going to have tonight. And, and, and this, this is some things I want you to remember. So if you brought pens, write them down. If you've got note, note app on your phone, write, you know, type them in. All right. First key thought is this. Boldness only comes when you know what you believe. Boldness only comes when you know what you believe. You know, boldness is a behavior. And it's a behavior that comes whenever you know what you believe. You believe in it so much that you're enabled, you're empowered to speak boldly because you know when you speak, you're so bold, you know what's going to happen because you believe it. You trust it. And so boldness comes when you know what you believe. But also, second key thought is this. When you believe deeply, that's when you speak boldly. It has to be a deep-rooted belief. It has to be a strong belief. A belief. When you, when you believe deeply is when you speak boldly. You know? In fact, let's say this together. Everybody say this. When I believe deeply, I'll speak boldly. Now, let's say it with a little enthusiasm, all right? We're talking about boldness, all right? And you're like, I'll speak boldly. All right, let's say this together. When I believe deeply, I'll speak boldly. Much better. When we believe deep, we'll speak bold. That's, that's the way it goes. When you read through the book of Acts, there's so many verses through the New Testament that you had Christians who believed so deeply in the resurrection that Jesus Christ was alive that everywhere they went they would speak about that resurrection they would share the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere they would go over and over and over again speaking boldly and I'll give you three out of dozens and hundreds of, of verses here and, and we'll put them on the screen so write these down you don't have to turn there you can write them down so you can reference later Acts chapter 9 verse 28 was about Saul and if you remember Saul, Saul was the guy that um, used to persecute Christians and even had a lot to do with some of them taking their lives. And after it had been transformed by Christ, the Bible says this, Saul moved about freely in Jerusalem. And it's up on the screen, doing what? Everybody say this with me. What was he doing? Speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. So we know Saul, now who's Paul, is speaking boldly. Well, so were Paul and Barnabas. Acts chapter 14, verse 3. Paul and Barnabas spent a considerable time there, and what were they doing? Speaking boldly for the Lord. So you've got, you've got Paul doing it, you've got Barnabas doing it, speaking boldly. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. You've got the disciples, and now they're under extraordinary persecution here, and they're starting to pray and ask God for even more boldness. The Bible says in verse 31, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and after they were filled with the Holy Spirit, then what did they do? They spoke the word of God, which way? Boldly. So these are guys who just weren't living, you know, to this lifestyle, Christian lifestyle witnessing. These were guys who were intentionally speaking boldly the Word of God. Why? Because they believed deeply. They spoke because they believed deeply. Listen, Acts chapter 3, give you a quick setup here. Acts chapter 3, you've got Peter and you've got John. And, and they're walking by the temple gate. A lot of us are familiar with this story. And they came across this guy who had been lame. Um, that means he, can't, he couldn't walk, all right? And, and, and the Bible says it was for over 40 years. 40 years this man had been unable to walk. And so over a, a, a period of 40 years, people who live in that region come to know this man. They see him there every day. They see him there, you know, um, laying by this temple gate. 
uh, begging. He had nothing, and, and he's asking people for money, asking people for help, asking people for assistance. And so over 40 years, you live in this guy's neighborhood, you're going to know who this guy is. Makes sense, right? And so they're walking by this man, and, and, they, and, and this guy is asking, hey, I need help. I, 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 you know, can you give me some silver? Can you give me some gold? And, and so Peter and John say, listen, we don't have silver and we don't have gold, but, but we'll give you what we do have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And this man miraculously gets healed. And now he is able to walk. And so, so in a community where they've seen this lame man for 40 years, this man unable to walk for 40 years, now all of a sudden can walk. Well, guess what? That would create some kind of buzz, right? A little bit of neighborhood community buzz. Well, that's what happened. So now the religious leaders are not happy about it. They didn't like the fact that now Peter and John are talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They, they, you know, they didn't believe in the resurrection, and they didn't want to hear about it. And so now they're aggravated, and now they're, they're threatening to put them on trial. They want to kill them. They want to, they want to question them. They want to stop them from pushing and spreading this new gospel, all right? And so, so now they're threatening to imprison them or kill them or trap them. All these things are going on. The problem is now there's this guy who couldn't walk who now can. Everybody knows him. Everybody knew he was lame. Everybody knew he couldn't walk. But now all of a sudden, he can walk. And so they're looking at Peter and John and they're thinking, well, they can't come down hard on him because they've got this guy who can walk. And there's obviously now something to what they're saying. And so now we pick up the story, Acts chapter 4. I had you turn there. Hopefully you held, hopefully you held your place. Verse 16, and we're going to see this dialogue taking place between these religious leaders. And this is where they go. They start asking this question. Well, what are we going to do with these men? They ask everybody, everybody living here in Jerusalem, they, knows, they know what they've done. And they know it's been an outstanding miracle. And then what does the Bible say? The Bible says, and they said, and we cannot deny it. I love that. I love reading And we can't deny it. Don't you love when God does something so miraculous and so obvious that people can't help it? They don't understand it. They don't necessarily believe it. But they can't deny it. How many of you have had a... I, I'm telling, I know that there are hundreds of people in this church who have, have testimonies because of miracles where God has done something both small and large in your life. Where there's no explanation, but you can't deny it. You can't deny it. There, there are people who are, there are marriages. There are, listen, and I love when God does this, when he does something that's so obvious that you can't deny it was God. You can't help but say, you know what, only God could have done this. And that there are people who have stories of marriages in this church who their marriages were headed down the toilet. It was just awful. You know, the people thought they hate each other. But then the husband gets his heart right with God, comes in, the wife, you know, he starts leading his family. The wife comes in and God starts working. And next thing you know, people see him and they're smoochy, smoochy. And they're like, man, what happened to you guys, you know? You hated each other. Now you're making out in front of us. What's the deal with that? And they're like, you know what? God happened to us. Obvious things where God comes through and heals. You know, there are people in here who have teenagers. And, and um, I experienced this a lot when I was a youth pastor. One of my favorite things was whenever you would have a teenager come to Regeneration Youth. And you've got teenagers you brought to Regeneration Youth. And they were into everything. Messed up and, you know, heading down a terrible path of life. But they came in and gave their heart to Jesus Christ. And God began to transform their life. And now they're doing better in school. And they've, they've got friends who are thinking, what is the deal? And they can't help but look and say, something happened. We can't deny that there's been a change in your life. And that's happened for so many people through people who've dealt with addictions, people who've dealt with bondage, people who've dealt with frustrations and, and depression where God caught a hold of you. Something rose up on the inside of you and you can't deny. And people, when they look at you, they can't deny that God got a hold of you. And that's what happens here, all right? And you, you've got these religious people and they're looking and they're saying, you know, I don't believe it, but I mean, this guy couldn't walk yesterday. And I mean, obviously he, he's doing cartwheels. He can do it. You know, he can walk now. And for 40 years, this guy was lame, but we can't deny that this guy can walk now. And that's the context. And now, verse 17. And so they said, well, we've got to put a stop to this. You know, we've got to... Uh, I, like, I like what he says here. He says, but to stop this thing from spreading any further. Now, you've got to understand how this was spoken, all right? To stop this thing. You know, it's not, he can't even call it what it is. He can't even say this movement, this Christian movement. He's got to say, we've got to stop this thing. You know, oh, God, give me a break. Got to stop this thing. And, you know, couldn't even say it. From spreading any further among the people, he says, we've got to warn these men, who's Peter and John, to no longer do what? We've got to warn these men to no longer speak. You cannot speak to anyone in this name. He wouldn't even say the name of Jesus. 
That's how aggravated, ticked off he is. All right, look at verse 18. They couldn't even say the name of Jesus. He says, and they called him in again and they commanded them. Now, pause right there. Anytime they would command, there was always a threat. All right, anytime you saw the religious leaders and they would command somebody, they, there was a threat attached to that, all right? And we don't know what the threat could have been, but it was, you know, imprisonment, death. It could have been anything. But they commanded them to not do what? To not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. To not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Now, keep, keep going. Now, Peter and John, they replied, well, you judge for yourself whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. And this is what I love. And here's what they said. For we cannot help. Everybody say, I can't help it. Everybody say, I, say it again. I can't help it. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. In other words, we believe so deeply. We believe in it so great, so much, that we're going to speak boldly no matter what you say, how you threaten us, no matter what. And I love this because you, you, there's, two, there's two Greek words in here that are translated as cannot help. And, and what they basically mean is it's not possible. It's, what, it's, it's not possible. All right, so they're saying, you you, you got to understand, you, you can threaten us to not speak, but this is not an option for us. It's not a possibility. It's literally impossible for us to stop talking. You can beat us, we'll just speak louder. It's not a possibility. They're saying, you can put us to death, but our last words when we are dying are going to be in the name of Jesus because they believe so great. And if you had seen what we've seen, if you had heard what we've heard, if you knew who we were and the forgiveness we received and who we are now, then you wouldn't be able to shut up about it either. And they were, they were saying, listen, we believe so deeply because of his forgiveness and his love and his power. Because of who he is, we can't keep this to ourselves. It's not possible. And some of you all know what I'm talking about. And I'm going to smack some hands this morning, or tonight. I'm going to smack some hands and maybe step on some toes because some of you have experienced this life changing power and you are being too quiet. You are being too quiet quiet. And I'm, I'm not trying to discourage you from living a lifestyle of witnessing. I'm trying to encourage you to step up and start speaking boldly. Because if you believe deeply in this life-changing Word of God, then it is going to cause you, it's going to stir in you to speak boldly. And for you to shut up is not an option. You don't know what I'm talking about. You about getting excited and saying things, and 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 you get so excited that you have to speak what's on your mind. You know what I'm talking about. All right, we do that in different ways, don't we? We do this all the time. Um, you get excited about something, you you can't stop talking about it. All right, guys get excited over sports and football games. I was just out there talking about fantasy football. It's not even real football. It's fake football, and I was fired up about it. All right, because I'm on a two game winning streak. Yeah. We get excited about movies. You go to a movie and all the trucks blow up and all the guys are like, yeah, yeah, it was the best movie ever. High five, chest bump, you know, and all the girls, you get your chick flick thing together and you go and you're like, oh my God, it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. At the end of the movie, she was like, Jack, I never let go. You know what always drove me nuts about that? As soon as she says that, she lets go. I never let go. What? That's why I don't watch chick flicks. They're stupid. Blow something up, all right? That's awesome. Anyway, you go to a restaurant. You go to a restaurant and the food is awesome. The service is awesome. You're talking about it. You're sharing about it. You won't stop talking about it because you enjoy it, all right? The food is amazing. You got to go. They're the best pizza ever, whatever it is. You can't help it because there are some things that you just can't help but to share. You know, one of those things for my family is, and my wife's sitting here, and my kids would vouch for this too, whenever we hear good music, especially music's got a good beat, almost every time in our house, some kind of dance-off takes place. It like triggers. You know, it could be a commercial and we're just like. <laughs> we've, had people, we've had people show up at our house unannounced and we, we, were, we had to like turn down the music and I answer the door and we're all sweaty and we're, they're like, what were you doing? And we're like, dancing? <laughs> <laughs> we go crazy. We love it. It's just when you, you know, it is. It's a family thing for us. We just start dancing and we have fun, you know, and, and unless Justin Bieber comes on and then we change the channel because 
<laughs> but there are times when you believe so deeply and, and you can't help but to share it. You can't help but to speak it. All right, and, and the, the Word of God is alive and it's so powerful that if there's anything worth sharing, anything worth speaking, that's it. It's the gospel. It's your life being changed because of Jesus. And so speaking boldly is not an, is, is not speaking boldly is not an option for believers. We are told, listen, if this is in you and you really believe in it, you're going to share it. You're going to speak it. And just being quiet and, and, and I'm living a good life and being a good Christian, that's not enough. It's not enough. There are times where you have to speak boldly. You have to. I'm going to give you a couple, couple specific examples, all right? Some, some, some in context here, some practical steps, some practical things for you, all right? I, I like to do this to where speaking boldly is necessary, or speaking boldly is something that will help or encourage you. If you believe deeply, these are things that you will do when you speak boldly, all right? First one, if you're taking notes, is this. If you believe because we believe so deeply... Because, there, because I believe so deeply, there are times I can't help but speak boldly to myself. To myself. And now let me, let me give you a further explanation of this. Because there are times where I have to speak boldly to myself. Talk, we're going to talk about King David for a minute. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. I'm just going to run through this one scripture, so we'll put it on the screen for you. The Bible says this, David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him. Well, I guess so. You know, people want to stone you. That's not a happy day. Um, there, but honestly, there's probably a lot of you who are distressed right now because of something difficult you're going through or because of some, you know, uphill battles you're, you're fighting right now. And you're distressed and you're not in your happy place, all right? And it's things, there are a lot of hard things. This is not an easy time to live right now. And, and the, this is what David did. Here's, this is what the Bible says. So David, he encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And I love this because you know what this means? It means David preached himself a sermon. David preached to himself. He encouraged himself. He spoke boldly to himself. And I don't know what he said. It could have been something like, you know, God, thank you because you brought me through. You helped me to defeat the lion. You helped me to defeat the bear. You helped me to overcome that. Or it could have been along the lines of, you know what, God, I thank you that, that in the face of adversity, I had to stand boldly in front of Goliath, a giant, and declare to him that, you know, you uncircumcised Philistine, how dare you come and defy the armies of God? You know, uh, people say that you're too big to get beat. Well, I say you're too big to miss. You know, somebody grab me a rock and duck. I'm about to take this guy out. All right, and then David, he starts to encourage himself in the Lord and starts to preach to himself. And I love this because I'm telling you, even if you've never preached a sermon, if you've never preached a sermon to anybody publicly, you can preach to yourself. If you never preach a sermon, it doesn't, you can preach to yourself. In, in fact, some of the best sermons I ever preached, I preached to myself. Sermon's so good, I gave myself an offering after. <laughs> but you know what's funny is that a lot of times before I'll preach to you, I'll preach to myself. There are times where I've preached uh, Isaiah 61 to myself, where I'm anointed. Uh, the Spirit of the Sovereign God has anointed me to preach, to preach freedom to the captives, to preach boldness, to heal broken hearts. I'm anointed. I, there are times where I have to preach myself back into faith and encourage myself in the Lord. Because the reality is this, there are going to be days where, where you are going through a distressing time similar to David. And it's going to be two or three days in between church services. So you can't just come to church and, and Pastor Huffman or Pastor Joplin or Pastor Josh or whoever preach to you and get you all fired up and built up. And you're not going to have anybody around you. It's going to be you and it's going to be God. And that's all you need, by the way. But in those moments, you better be able to preach because you're still going to have that word that's either in your hand or in your heart. And during those times, you need to be able to preach to yourself and encourage yourself back into faith. David encouraged himself in the Lord. Some of you didn't even know you were a preacher. You didn't even know. We got a church full of preachers tonight. Full of preachers. In fact, here's what I want you to do. I want you to, I want you to point your finger like a preacher. You know, point that finger to the person beside you and say, you didn't know it, but you were a preacher. <laughs> you didn't know it, but you were a preacher. Church full of preachers. 
preacher, I didn't even know it. You know what that means? It means the next time you're overwhelmed, maybe you're a, sing, you're a single, single mom, maybe you're a stay-at-home mom, and you've got a house full of babies, you've got a house full of diapers, you've got a house full of dishes, and you don't think you can do it, well, you guess what you're going to do? You're going to preach to yourself. Help me out. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Josh, I can do all things. Josh, you can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You're going to preach to yourself. Next time you're feeling overwhelmed, you're at the office, papers file, you know, are piling up and you've got deadlines approaching or you've got extra time they're calling you in and you don't think you're going to get time off or all these things going on and you think, I don't think I can do it. No, you can do it. You're going to say, I know I might be weak, but he's strong. It's not by my might nor by my power, but by his, says the Lord. You're going to preach to yourself when you're afraid God hasn't given me the spirit of fear Josh you don't have the spirit of fear you have love you have power and you have a sound mind Josh so you're not afraid you're going to preach to yourself and you're going to speak boldly speak boldly if you won't preach to yourself you sure won't preach to your neighbors if you won't speak boldly to yourself the word of God you won't speak boldly the word of God outside and so you've got to learn, if you're going to start speaking boldly, preach to yourself. Because I believe so deeply, I'm going to speak boldly. I'm going to encourage myself in the Lord. Church full of preachers. New Life Church, I want this church to be known in this region as a church full of bold speaking preachers. Everywhere you go, you will encourage yourself. That's the first step. Number, number two is this. Secondly is this. Because we believe so deeply, I can't help but encourage you. I'll encourage me and speak boldly to me, but I'll also encourage you and speak boldly to you. I'm telling you, and I believe this with everything in me, and that the body of Christ, especially Christians, that hands down, we should be the most encouraging people on this planet. Without question, you and I should be the most encouraging people that live. You know, you should say amen to that because it's true. The Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. We're told this. Encourage one another. How often? The Bible says encourage one another daily. Every single day, as long as it's called day. You should be encouraging other people, using God's word to lift them up. And if you go a day without encouraging, you're missing it. There should not be a single day that goes by if you are a follower of Christ and a believer where you have not encouraged somebody. Well, I'm not around all kinds of weird people or different people or work people. Or di well, so what? Are you around anybody? You know, you're speaking boldly to yourself. Are you around anybody? Encourage them. Listen, my wife and I, we encourage our children every day. And we're real there are days where we're like, shut up. Okay, I get that. But you know what? We've realized that in this world... It's so difficult because this world is 10 times over trying to smash any hopes and dreams they could ever have. Telling them what they can't accomplish, what they won't accomplish, what they can't do. What... And so we realize that we've got to speak encouragement into them. You know, every single day we speak something into my son. We'll say, you know, Jaden, we believe that you're the smartest, strongest, wonderfully gifted by God little boy that's ever walked this earth. We'll speak something to encourage them every single day. Every night before they go to bed, we make sure that we encourage them. Our daughter, we'll let her know, Ava, you're a gifted woman. You have leadership. And God's going to use you. You're a sweetheart. And God's going to do great things in, your, in and through your life. And, and we'll encourage our daughter. There have been a few times where we told Ava, like, Ava, we encourage her and she'll respond thanks I know I'm awesome and so we're like mental note maybe encourage her a little less <laughs> she's something else but there's got to be something in a believer that just that's so deep rooted that you've got to encourage others because you know through your encouragement just a little bit of encouragement just a small amount of encouragement will change the direction of someone's day and even life. You're not just patting somebody on the back and saying you can do it. No, you're speaking the word of God boldly. You're literally sowing this word into their life. It's not just high five, we can do it. No, this is encouraging through God's word. This is inviting the power and the presence of God into that person's life. They may not even understand it, but they won't be able to deny it. 
And there's got to be something that just you want to encourage and change someone's life. And listen, how do I know this? I know this because there have been times in my life where I needed encouragement. Where I didn't think I was going to make it. I didn't think I was going to get through it. Where I was thinking, man, I don't have this, this. Maybe I missed it on this God thing and this church thing. And I'm not cut out to lead. I'm not cut out to minister. I'm not cut out to run and, and, and function like this. I, I can't do it. And, and there have been people who are in my life, my wife and my parents and, and different people in the church who have sent notes and encouraging letters and things that were just godly timed in a moment where I was distressed. And they, God used them to encourage me. And there was something holy about it. Times where my wife said, you know, Josh, we're not giving up. We're not quitting. We're going to push through. You know, don't grow weary. Don't, don't grow you know, weak through this. Just trust God. Remember that scripture. At the proper time, you will reap as long as you don't quit. There's a harvest that will come as long as you stay and stick with God through this, through this time. And, and I'm standing here right now and talking to encourage you. I want you to understand, don't quit. It may be tough, it may be difficult, but don't quit. You know, don't grow weary. Don't grow weak through this time because at the proper time, the harvest will come. You will reap if you don't quit. If you don't give up, don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up on your unsafe family. Don't give up on your, your jobless situation. Don't give up on what's going on in your situation financially. Don't give up on your ministry that God has placed in your heart. Don't give up on your dreams. Don't give up overcoming and beating that addiction. Don't give up, especially don't give up on God because God will never give up on you. Encourage someone. Sometimes you've just got to encourage somebody every day. Encourage them. Christians, we should be the most encouraging people. New Life Church, we should be known in this region as the most encouraging people that are here. Everywhere we go, we want to be identified as a people who encourage and lift people up and help them through and speak boldly. And I'm believing God, and I'm praying that there are some of you, you won't even be able to leave tonight without God placing somebody in your heart, maybe somebody here, in your heart that you are assigned to encourage. And you'll walk up to them and say, I don't even know you, but I just know this, that God wants me to share with this with you. And you encourage them in the Lord. And they'll receive that, and God will use that to bring some fruit and harvest in their life and change their life. I'm believing that this happens tomorrow. You're at work and you're having a rough day, but you're going to be an encourager because you're going to speak boldly because you believe in this gospel. People who encourage because I believe so deeply I can't help but speak boldly. I can't help but speak boldly. Third and final thing I'm going to talk about tonight, and this is the, this is the most important in my favor, because I believe so deeply I can't help but lead you toward Christ. I can't help it. This is what the disciples said. They said, you can beat us. You can, you can lock us up. You can even threaten to kill us. Verse 20, but we cannot help speaking about what we've seen and heard. We can't help it. I can't help it. It's not possible. We're not going to do it. You can't talk us out of it. We're not going to stop. It's never, ever going to go away. Me, me not talking about Jesus. I'm going to constantly talk about Jesus. If you've seen what I've seen, heard what I've heard, received what I've received from Jesus Christ, the forgiveness and the love and the mercy. If you knew how much he had transformed my life from who I used to be and the liar and the cheater and the mess that I was before to who I am now, a forgiven saint of God who God has is, God is made righteous, God has made holy, and God is working. If you knew who I was, you'd understand that I've got to say what I'm going to say. I can't help it. And that's what these disciples are saying. Listen, you may as well, if you want me to stop, you may as well ask for the ocean to dry up, for the sun to stop shining, for the birds to stop chirping, for, for, for Kentucky to win a football game. It's never going to happen. <laughs> Lord, I apologize. It's never going to happen. I'm going to say I'm going to speak God's word boldly because it's in me. 
And this is something that every believer is called, every believer is assigned. And, and, and some of you all know what I'm talking about. You've been there. And some of you don't know what I'm talking about. And you're like, man, I don't know. But there's some of you, because you've been saved and set free, you just can't hold on to it. But there are a lot of us who've been saved and set free. But we've become so accustomed. We've become into church and we've, we've gotten used to this thing. And now it's more of a routine. And we are living good Christian holy lives. But we have stopped saying it. And you've been too quiet. You've been too quiet. And it's time for us to rise up and to start speaking boldly. And so when you speak boldly, you believe deeply. And I, and, and I would say this tonight, you know, because here's the deal. If you don't speak boldly, well, then maybe it's because you don't believe deep enough. Because why in the world would you say something that you're not quite sure would actually happen? You're unsure of it or you don't trust it. And if you're not speaking boldly, maybe, I'm not saying it's definitely, I'm saying maybe, it's because you don't believe deeply. And I say that because whenever you believe deeply, and this, this New Testament is full of examples of men and women of God who believe deeply, that in the face of death, in the face of trials, in the face of judgment and religious leaders and persecution, and they spoke boldly no matter what. Because if you believe it deep, you're going to speak boldly. You're going to speak boldly, you know. And, and we've got to stop settling for this politically correct, you know, goofy lower things of the world. And, you know, stupid world selling out to material things and buying in the, the latest fads and all of this junk. And, no, listen, you, are, you and I, we're preachers. We're difference makers. That's who we are because of who God is and because of what He's done in our life. And so that's who we are. And so because of that, you can't hold that in. You can't let it get stirred and mixed up and blended with all the world's garbage to where now it just becomes quiet and now you're living happy little Christian golf clap lives. Come on. Speak boldly. Speak boldly. Speak boldly to yourself and encourage yourself. I know you're going through tough times. I go through tough times. That's why God gave us His Word and the Holy Spirit. So encourage yourself and preach that sermon to yourself. Preach yourself back into faith. And then when you show up to church, man, we're going we're gonna to go nuts in here. But then, secondly, speak boldly and encourage others. See, you're, you're going through distress, but you have God. There are people who don't have God and going through distress. The only access to God they have is you. And so take what you've been given and give it. Share it. Speak boldly into others and encourage. Every day, every one of us should be encouraging somebody. If it's not a complete stranger, then it's somebody in your family. It's a child or it's a friend or it's a, an acquaintance. It could be anybody, but encourage. Make it a point as a believer to allow God to use you to encourage every day. Every single day. And then lead others to Jesus. This is not, we're not speaking boldly just to make people happy and to pacify them and make them feel okay. No, we are leading people towards Christ. It's the most important thing you and I can do in this world. It's the number one purpose that we all have. Some of us have specific callings in different ways that God's called us and spread us out. But the one thing we all have in common is that they all end up the common denominator is that they all end up pointing to the same goal, and that is leading people to Jesus. Every single one of us. So we're going to speak boldly. Bow your, head, bow your head and close your eyes. Lord, we believe deeply, and so we're going to speak boldly. And I pray that our church, Lord, every person here has such a strong belief in your son, Jesus Christ, and the resurrection that he is alive, that Lord, just like Peter and John, we would stand up and Lord God, we would declare with boldness the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere we go. And I pray, Lord God, that you stir us supernaturally to be bold. Every single person in here, not odd, weird, bold, or kooky, strange, bold, but bold with your love and your grace and your power so that we can impact people for good. And help us, Lord God, to become preachers. 
We don't have to stand up behind a, a, po a podium or on a platform to be a preacher, Lord God. We can be a preacher and preach to ourselves when the enemy attacks and we're distressed, Lord God. We're going to speak God's word. We're going to preach to ourselves that word that we have in our heart. And Lord God, we're going to speak boldly to others and be encouragers, Lord God.